Would you take your Bibles with me and turn in them to Genesis chapter 11 this morning? I'm thrilled to be with you this morning, thrilled to have you here this morning because we've got good news to delve into in this morning's text. As I shared last week, we're coming off of spending 30 weeks in the book of Genesis in chapters 1 through 11. The last 13 weeks have been particularly focused in chapters 3 through 11. And I want you to catch the flavor of chapters 3 through 11. Chapters 3 through 11 are communicating to the reader of Genesis, this is what life looks like when man starts deciding what is good and what is evil. So it gives you a bracket, to, to a window through which you can see what life looks like when God's not there or God's not relied upon. And when you look through a window of a house, of a family who stopped relying on God's definition of good and evil, that house will be filled with abuse, hatred, enmity, strife, cursing, adultery, theft. That's essentially what happens to a household when it begins turning away from God's good and what God calls evil. This is exactly what Hosea comes upon as a prophet of Israel. He says, I look upon the land, he said, and there's no steadfast love of God. There's no knowledge of God. There's no relationship with God. And then right after he says that, he says, instead, there's bloodshed, adultery, swearing, murder, strife. In other words, when God leaves the scene, it stops being summer and it turns to winter. And that's true for any household. And that's true for any nation, and that's true for any planet. We've got police officers in the congregation here. And they know, as well as you, that as our nation begins to continue to turn its face away from the Lord, their job gets amped up. When we turn away from God, There's awfulness left in its wake. And we leave them to deal with it. This is what happened in Genesis 3 through 11. What you have is you have mankind becoming a competitor with God. You see it all over the place. You see Cain get mad because God chose Abel's sacrifice over his, and since Cain can't kill God, he kills Abel. You see God give Adam one wife, Lamech comes and he says, I can do it better, I'll take two. You say God promised to Cain, Cain, if anybody kills you, they will experience greater vengeance seven times. Lamech comes and he says, seven isn't good enough. God got it wrong. I'm a competitor with God. So it will be 70 times that which a man did to me. You find humanity in Genesis 6 in this really obscure text, sort of seeking a relationship with the angelic realm. Why? So that they can get on par with God. They're a competitor with God now, and so they need... Super strength, super longevity. And then you see the Tower of Babel, which is a place where people sought to make what? A name for themselves. Reputation. They wanted their reputation to be at the same status as the reputation of God Himself. And so this is... This is the place we've come from, and that's why, you know, it's a dark place. And now we're entering a new stage in redemptive history. And that new stage in redemptive history is God saying, okay, I've let humanity run its course in the way that it sought to do things, and now I'm going to step in. I've given you the window. I've allowed you to go next to humanity's house and open the window and hear and see everything that goes on in a house that's separated from God. It looks like hell. 
essentially, godlessness. And now I'm going to step in and I'm going to do it my way. And let's see what you'll choose. That's essentially the entrance into Genesis, the end of Genesis 11, and the opening of Genesis 12. It's God saying, this is my route. That was humanity's route. This is now my route. It's fascinating to me that this very Sunday, we stand with one leg in one threshold, and on one side of the threshold, and one leg on the other side of the threshold. We are spanning, essentially, two anniversaries this Sunday that were life-altering events in human history. Radically life-altering events in human history. One anniversary was celebrated last week, last Wednesday, and one anniversary will be celebrated this Halloween on October 31st. The first life-altering event was the Bolshevik Communist Revolution led by Vladimir Lenin that took place on October 25th, 1917. It's the 100th year anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. The second anniversary that we're spanning, we'll celebrate this coming week, took place on October 31st, 1517, and that was the Protestant Reformation. So we've got one leg in last week with the Bolshevik Revolution. We've got one leg in next week, which is the Protestant Reformation. And it's fascinating to me that this Sunday lies right in the middle because essentially, if, if you look at the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and you look at the Protestant Reformation, we... If, if, I chose, if I could choose a portion in Scripture that best met that period, I would say Genesis 3-11 through 11 would, would be typified in the Bolshevik Revolution, and Genesis 12 on would be typified in the Protestant Re, uh, Reformation. What was the Bolshevik Revolution all about? Well, it came following the ideology of Karl Marx, and its end game was a truly liberated human being. That was its end game. But that liberation came at the cost of the absence of God. That part of the communist revolution, it understood that there is no God, it's a material world, and that's it. There's no deity involved. And it's out of that world that they believed they would find liberty. And Marx believed that this revolution would sweep across the globe and everybody would be wrapped up in the liberty that it promised. And this is even true to an extent. One Westerner, Al Mohler records, said, I have seen the future. Looking at the communist revolution, I have seen the future and it works. But then Al Mohler goes on to describe the future of the communist revolution. And here's what he said. We are looking at the fact that the Soviet, Soviet communism almost surely led to well over 100 million deaths. Add to that about 300 million deaths, either by direct action or by starvation that came in the wake of the Maoist communist revolution in China. You see, this is a perfect typification of Genesis 3-11. through When man does it his way, he can't help but leave life, which is God. And so when man says, I've got it figured out, it ends in death because life exists where God is. And when you turn your back on God, death is the result. Period. It's typified in the communist revolution. Lenin himself would go on and say, I've made a mistake, but it's too late. I have dreams of floating in the bloodshed that I've left behind me. Ultimately, what Russia needed was 10 Francis of Assisi's. That's what he said. So we've got one leg in Genesis 3 through 11 right now, 
And that is typified in the communist revolution. But then we've got another leg in Genesis 12 and beyond. And I believe this could be typified with the Protestant Reformation, led by a lecturer, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther. In the midst of the Protestant Reformation took place that began on October 31st, 1517, where it said that Martin Luther took his 95 theses and nailed it to the door of his home church. Some say he just sent it in a letter to the Pope. But in whichever way it happened, that 95 theses began the disassembling of Catholicism as they knew it. Luther didn't seek to start a new church. He he started just simply to reform the Catholic church, but had a death sentence placed on him instead. And as a result of the Protestant uh, Reformation, five beliefs came out of that Reformation. Five solas, and I want to go to that on the screen so that you can see, see them for what they were. And I want you to catch... The, the God-centeredness of these solas. You've got the, the Bolshevik Revolution that was very man-centered, man-engineered, man-strategically planned. But you've got the solas that look away from man and what man can come up with, and it looks solely at God and has God at the center of it 500 years ago in 1517. Sola fide, by faith alone. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. And the Catholic religion had so much of man stuff intertwined with these, they affirmed these, but they inserted man-ishness to them. Luther moved away from that. Solus Christus, through Christ alone. In other words, our works don't add anything to our salvation Sola gratia, by grace alone, and sole de gloria, glory to God alone. So what I want you to catch as we sort of straddle these two revolutions that took place, life-altering events on planet Earth, I want you to just compare the two. I want you to see one versus the other. One is typified by a man-centered ideology, and one is typified by a God-centered ideology. One ended with death. One ended with life everywhere. It's not to say that the Protestant Reformation didn't have problems in it, but the end result was no comparison to what the Bolshevik Revolution had. And this is a great image of Genesis 3 through 11 and then moving on to Genesis 12 through 50. One is man's way and it ends in bloodshed and murder and strife. One is God's way and it ends in peace for multiplied millions. One is a man centered hope and one is a totally God centered hope. Understanding that man is hopeless in and of himself. And so now we enter into the end of Genesis 11 and on to Genesis 12, where God says, okay, now it's my way. We looked at man's way, now it's my way. I would like to introduce to you a man named Abram. Chuck Swindoll tells about Oliver Cromwell as a se- the 17th century English soldier and statesman, statesman who became well known for his authenticity, his transparency, his forthrightness. He describes a time in Cromwell's life where he was so frustrated with politics, so frustrated with his colleagues, that he stood before Parliament and said this, and I quote, Cromwell said, I would have been glad to have lived under my woodside to have kept a flock of sheep rather than undertook a government such as this. He's a very straightforward man. It's said that when he was sitting for his portrait, he told his painter this, Mr. Lilly, 
I desire you would use all your skill to paint my picture truly like me and not flatter me at all. But remark all these roughness, pimples, warts, and everything you see me, as you see me. Otherwise, I will not pay a farthing for it. He wanted a straightforward picture of himself. Nothing flattered about him. And I share this to say, this is what God gives us of his choice in the man Abram. God does not give a flattering picture of Abram. He gives a very forthright, straightforward picture of this man named Abram. <clears throat> Nothing is cleaned up. And as he gives us this picture of Abram, every single person in this room would say, that's the last person I'd pick. Everybody would say that. I just, I, I, I marvel at the fact, at the contrast between Noah and Abram. It's unbelievable. Listen to how Noah is described in Genesis 6, 8 through 10. Listen to what, listen what the scriptures say. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons. You get this picture. Noah is like, he sits at the front of the class. He's the one that brought the apple to the teacher. That's who Noah was. And it's as though God picked the very best mankind had to offer before the flood came. He picked Noah, top of the class. And even out of Noah, the blameless and righteous man, his descendants ended with what? The Tower of Babel. Man coming together against God himself. So in other words, it's as though God's saying, the best you have to offer, Noah, he ends up here. Drunk, right after he's out of the ark. This is the best humanity has to offer. And so God says, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to pick common clay. I'm going to pick a man named Abram. Do you know that nothing is said about Abram's walk with God? Not a single thing in Genesis, Genesis 11. He's not introduced as having any badges of righteousness, any badges of blamelessness. He doesn't stand out in his generation. He is common clay. And what's absolutely astounding about God's pick of Abram is that up to this point in Genesis, God is very, very, very clear that the only solution to mankind is a descendant. It is a seed from Eve that's going to crush the serpent's head. That's why the author of Genesis is so diligent to give us genealogies so that we can trace that golden thread of the descendant that will end up eventually with Jesus Christ. And catch, catch this. It's wrapped up all in genealogies. The person's kids. And that's good for Noah because Noah had what? He had three sons. Good. Good pick. That's a great pick. Noah's got three kids. We've got three options. If two of the boys get knocked off, we got one that this descendant can come through. That's good news. What about Abram, God? What does he have? Well, he and his wife, they're barren. What? Wait a minute. Didn't you say it has to come from a... Yeah, I did. They don't, they don't have it. They're old. They got no kids. It's a terrible pick. Author of Genesis wants to make that clear. He says it two different ways. Look at Genesis 11.30. Now Sarah was barren. In case you didn't catch it, she had no child. In other words, this is about as hopeless a situation as humanly possible. This guy doesn't follow God. Nothing said about his relationship with God, and he's got no kids. Worst human pick ever. And God did it. God picked him. That's his choice. I'm going with Abram. 
humanly the worst possible choice. And it's not just that. There's not just an absence of Noah's relationship with God. We're given some information about it. Abram is associated with the Ur of the Chaldeans. What do we know about the Ur of Chaldeans? Well, we know through the rest of the Scriptures that the Chaldeans are associated with the Babylonians. Well, what do we know about the Babylonians? We know about the Babylonians that any time Babylon is mentioned, even if it's not specifically talking about the city of Babylon, if someone says, Silvis is Babylon, an astute reader of the Scriptures would understand that to say that Silvis is a bad place. It's essentially like we might hear the term Las Vegas. You hear, ooh, Sin City. That's what Babylon was like. Babylon is always put up against God's city. It's as though there's only two cities. Babylon city, man's city, and God's city. And they're always against each other. And that's who Abraham's associated with. And in case that didn't convince you, look no further than Joshua 24.2. Look at how Joshua recounts redemptive history and the man Abram. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. This is God's pick. Isn't it brilliant? I love it. I love it. I love how God picks these people. Because we're going to see how God picks people throughout the rest of the Scriptures. And it's always going to be like this. We're always going to be shocked, mystified at God's choice. The last human pick possible, that's the one that God generally picks. Look at what John Calvin writes of Abram. He says, Abram was plunged in the filth of idolatry And now God freely stretches forth His hand to bring back the wanderer. Look at what Sidney Gradenus writes. He says, Abram can contribute absolutely nothing to the new start for God's kingdom on earth. Another precarious beginning. And if you've been reading Genesis, and if you've been listening to these past 30 sermons, you would catch something of a parallel between this pick of Abram and the way God started creation. Let me remind you, did God start creation with a one-moment instantaneous picture of a beautiful, picturesque creation working just the way He wanted it to? That's not how God started creation. He started with a watery chaos, a formless mass that that lacked no form and lacked any fulfillment, any filling. And then God takes this watery chaos and He takes six days to add form to it, first three days, and add fullness to it, second set of three days. And I've made the point over and over and over again, in creating the world that That way, God was presenting to mankind, the reader of Genesis, a theological paradigm that says this is who our God is. Our God takes that that which doesn't have form, doesn't have fullness, and He adds those things to it. He takes something that's not beautiful and He makes it picturesque. That's who God is. And so when He picks Abram, it makes sense with what He did in Genesis 1-2 in creating the world formless and lacking fullness. And everybody who is like Abram that feels unformed and not full, God says, I'm pleased to minister to you because you're poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is essentially synonymous with formless and void. You get it. You get that you need help. Jesus says, I didn't come for those that think they have it together I came for those that understand their depravity, understand their bankruptness of soul. And this is who Abram is. He's common clay. He's worshiping idols. He doesn't have any kids. He's a mess. 
This is the idea. And then we start hearing things like this. Out of you, I'm going to bring about the amount of descendants that outnumber the stars in the sky. And we say, impossible. Out of you, Abram, I'm going to bring about the amount of descendants that outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. And we say, impossible. And God says, I love it. I love it. Because I want to show you how high of a mountain that I can climb with one step. So that you see my glory. I've got in my pocket, picked it up on the way into church this morning off the sidewalk. Anybody know what this is? It's hard to see, isn't it? It's much harder to see than the tree it was formed into that dropped this. It's an acorn. I want to read to you, this is the devotion, I can't speak highly enough about it, this is the devotion that we as a family try to read every morning before we take the kids off to school. It's Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing by Sally Lloyd-Jones. And in it, she has a devotion called Acorn Power. And I want to read it to you. An acorn is only small. To look at it, you'd think it was weak and not very important at all. But from one acorn, a mighty oak tree can grow. And from one mighty oak tree, a whole forest can grow. A whole forest is inside a single acorn. And the Bible says, because of Jesus, all the riches of God, all of heaven's vast resources, all the power in the universe have come to live inside you. Colossians 1.11 You will be strengthened with all God's glorious power. You see, God takes Abram, who's like a tiny acorn as far as humanity is concerned, and as far as reality is concerned, he's just a peon. And God says, yes, he is. But because he's connected to me, I'm going to do incredible things through this guy. Only because, and you're going to see him make mistake after mistake after mistake, just like Noah, but he leans on me like Noah did. And as a result of that, I'm going to do marvelous things through this acorn, Abram. That's the idea. And you see, friends, this is what God's seeking to do with his choice of Abram. He chose a man that none of us could say, well, he did choose the best. I mean, you know, was it him? It could have been a little bit of Abram. God says, I want to make it very clear. It had nothing to do with Abram. The only thing Abram got right is he leaned every atom of his being on my being. It's the only thing Abram got right. And because of that, I saw fit to bless and give fruit out of the dead loins, out of the dead womb of Abram and Sarah. I could have titled this sermon, Against All Odds, because that's what it is. You see, catch this. It's best for us to see the supremacy of God because it is only He that is supreme. See, God chooses the weak so that no one can boast. The only thing people can say is, it's God. It's God. And friends, you, if you're living the Christian life, you will be in moments where great things happen, but the only thing you can say is, ah, it's God. It's just God. It's the only thing I can tell you. I leaned on Him, and He answered. The, the, the focus isn't on me, it's on Him. God is the center of the circle, not Abram. The only reason Abram's mentioned is because he's a lens through whom we can see the glory of God. That's it. So listen, God is doing a good thing. Babel was a place where humankind meant to erect a name for themselves. But God says, I'm going to take Shem, who is the Hebrew word for name, and he says, and I'm going to make a name out of Abram, which is essentially a name 
of myself. And when you look at what happens with Abram, you will, you will see me take front and center. And that's the best thing for humanity. I want you to listen to this quote by uh, Pastor John Piper, how he begins his book, The Supremacy of God, in preaching. Listen to what he says. People are starving for the greatness of God. But most of them would not give this diagnosis of their troubled lives. The majesty of God is an unknown cure. There are far more popular prescriptions on the market, but the benefit of any other remedy is brief and shallow. Far more prescriptions on the market, but the benefit of any other remedy is brief and shallow. Preaching that does not have the aroma of God's greatness may entertain for a season, but it will not touch the hidden cry of the soul. Show me your glory. And friends, I've got to tell you, it's fascinating that Piper in this quote chooses words like diagnosis and cure and prescription. Because if you're watching the news at all, you'll find that President Trump just recently held a press conference to declare the opioid crisis in America. He called it a national emergency. What are opioids? What are painkillers that lead on to other higher drugs? The opioid crisis. I just want you to consider some facts released in a New York Times article by Josh Katz. He says this. Catch this. Just catch the gravity of this. Drug overdoses are the leading cause of death for Americans under 50. And deaths are rising faster than ever, primarily because of opioids. That's the one thing I think he gets wrong. It's not because of opioids. That may be the end result, but it's not their fault. Whose fault is it? A heart that's not satisfied with the supremacy of God, so it seeks to alleviate its longing in drugs. That's the problem. Not here to preach against painkillers. I'm here to preach against a longing in our heart that we seek to satisfy with painkillers. Replace painkillers with anything else you want. Pornography, alcohol. You replace it anything. Comfort, vacations, TV, adultery, gossip. Anything is seeking to to satisfy this longing that only God can satisfy. Overdoses killed more people last year than guns or car accidents. One in 50 deaths in 2015 were drug-related. It's estimated over 2 million Americans have problems with opioids. Of the 97 million people that took prescription painkillers in 2015, 12 million, 12 million did so without being directed by a doctor. While this crisis has its roots in overprescription of opioid painkillers, heroin and fentanyl are now taking off. The age that has hit the most is for those in their 20s and 30s. But in 2000, the most common age for drug deaths was 40. Friends, when we come to think of a national emergency, we don't think of something we're doing to ourselves. We think of something that's coming upon us, like a drought or a flood or a forest fire. But this is self-caused. Why? has nothing to do with a pill. That's the end result. That's a symptom of a greater longing. And what is that longing? What's ultimately killing people? What's ultimately killing people is a lack of satisfaction in the supremacy of God. And so God says, hey, everybody gather around Genesis 11 and Genesis 12 because I'm going to show you how awesome I am. And when I show you how awesome I am, you will find the satisfaction you long for. It will be there. But what we need is a new orientation. You see, we're revolving around ourselves and our self-fixes, and we're not revolving around God. 
and His glory and His goodness. The goodness that will actually kill people because they go to the stake. I want to read to you for a moment an account of a young woman named Jane Grey who lived during the time of the Reformation and she died as a result of her conversion to Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear, as I read through this account, the satisfaction that she has in God. The assurance that she has in God. Such joy in God that she's willing to do what she did in this moment on February 10th, 1554. Two days before Lady Jane Grey climbs the scaffold, the Catholic chaplain, John Feckenham, enters Jane's cell in the Tower of London in the hopes of saving her soul. Or so he thinks. This is written by Scott Hubbard. Queen Mary, a.k.a. Bloody Mary, had already signed her cousin Jane's death warrant, but she sent her seasoned chaplain, to see if he could woo Jane back to Rome before her execution. Jane is about 17 years old. A charged debate follows, Hubbard writes. Feckenham, the Catholic apologist, and Jane, the Reformed teenager, he presses that justification comes by faith and works. Remember sola fide. Faith alone. He presses faith and works. She stands her ground on sola fide. He asserts that the Eucharistic bread and wine are the very body and blood of Christ. She maintains that the elements symbolize Jesus' saving work. He affirms the Catholic Church's authority alongside Scripture. She insists that the church sits underneath the piercing gaze of God's Word. I am sure we too shall never meet again, Feckenham finally tells Jane, implying her damnation. But Jane turns the warning back on him. Truth it is that we shall never meet again unless God turn your heart. The morning of February 12th, brought Jane to the wall of the central white tower where a small crowd and an executioner awaited her arrival. Turning to the onlookers, Jane announced, I do look to be saved by no other mean but only by the mercy of God in the blood of His only Son, Jesus Christ. She then knelt and recited Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. Once blindfolded, Jane groped her way to the executioner block and laid her head on its groove. The last sound the crowd heard before the axe thudded into the block was a prayer from Jane's 17-year-old voice, Lord, into Thy hands I commend my spirit. So ended the life of Lady Jane Grey, the teenage martyr. You see, friends, C.S. Lewis writes this, We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. And add opioids to the list. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Friends, as I prayed at the beginning, we are so prone to look inward for our solution. We are so prone to look outward for our solution to the ache. We are not prone to look upward. But that's where the solution is. 
Philip Yancey in his book Rumors tells about a new word that he learned. And if you've ever read Philip Yancey, you know that he's a very well-read guy. And so for him to learn a new word, it's pretty fascinating, pretty marvelous. And the word that he learned, he says, he learned by standing by a series of fish ladders in Seattle, Washington. And the word was smultification. Smultification. He goes on to describe that it's a word to to describe a particular stage in a freshwater salmon's life. Yancey writes this, he says, After several months of solitary contentment as a bottom dweller and jealous patroller of its modest territory, the fish, the salmon, takes a sudden interest in the larger world. It bobs to the surface now and then. It explores surrounding rocks and pools, and then one day it embarks on a journey far downstream where a vast new world awaits it, the Pacific Ocean. A whole complex of bodily changes take place, Yancey says, during this time. The fish becomes more streamlined. The color of its scales changes to silver. The endocrine activity increases and its gills adjust to allow for a greater tolerance of sodium and potassium. The salmon is preparing to do something exceedingly rare among freshwater creatures. Switch to a saltwater environment. And friends, what I'm calling you to this morning, what the Scriptures in going to Genesis 12 are calling you to out of Genesis 3-11, through is it's calling you to a God-centered environment, a God-centered view, an entranced vision on God. It's calling you out of the man-centered life that looks inward and outward horizontally to fix its ache, to satisfy its longing. And Genesis 12 is saying, watch me. I'm going to take a nobody and I'm going to do the most miraculous thing possible. Watch me do it. And as you watch me do it, keep your eyes on me and all your other concerns will be cared for. Don't take them off me. I'm preparing you for a much larger world. You've been like the salmon that's in this small pool and doesn't go any, doesn't venture anywhere. It's just lo- it's located to this little spot. But I'm calling you to the Pacific Ocean, I'm calling you a much bigger world, a much more satisfying existence. Come with me, would you? John Piper in his book, The Supremacy of God, tells of a pretty incredible moment in his ministry. I want to read it to you. He says, years ago, the January prayer week at our church, during the January prayer week at our church, I decided to preach on the holiness of God from Isaiah 6. I resolved on the first Sunday of the year to unfold the vision of God's holiness found in the first four verses of that chapter. And he quotes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the fountains of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. This is the passage that Piper preached on. And listen to what he says. So I preached on the holiness of God and did my best to display the majesty and glory of such a great and holy God. Catch this. I gave not one word of application to the lives of our people. Application is essential in the normal course of preaching, but I felt led that day to make a test. Would the passionate portrayal of the greatness of God in and of itself meet the needs of people? I didn't realize that not long before this Sunday, 
one of the young families of our church discovered that their child was being sexually abused by a close relative. It was incredibly traumatic. They were there that Sunday morning and sat under that message. Catch this. I wonder how many advisors to us pastors today would have said, Pastor Piper, can't you see your people are hurting? Can't you come down out of the heavens and get practical? Don't you realize what kind of people sit in front of you on Sunday? Some weeks later, I learned the story. The husband took me aside one Sunday after a service, and he quotes the father. John, These have been the hardest months of our lives. Do you know what has gotten me through? The vision of greatness of God's holiness that you gave me the first week of January. It has been the rock we could stand on. You see, friends, our job in this life is not to self-help, to self-medicate, to self-fix. Our job is to actually self-help in one way, by looking to him who is ready to help the self. Amen? That's what we're called to. And as we do that, as we have that God-entranced vision Our family problems, our marriage problems, our drug problems will largely take care of themselves because we will find a superior satisfaction in God Himself. Amen? Amen. I received a text this week from a member of the church and they just shared how in their their time with God, God ministered to them in a marvelous way, and the way that He ministered to them was not by hitting a particular need that they had been praying about or worried about. He ministered to them by showing Him just a glimpse of who He is. And that was enough. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you musicians to come as we close our service.